بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah Almighty created both male and female and this is one of the signs of the power and majesty and creation of Allah Almighty because it's impossible for two gender to evolve by themselves. This is not possible at all. It's impossible. So Allah Almighty mentions this reality often and often again in the Holy Quran. This is Allah Almighty who created the, the partners, the two parts. And this reality is mentioned in the Holy Quran regarding human being as well. So Allah Almighty first created Adam and then from Adam he created Eve. From them both all humanity sprang. Now with this creation of Allah Almighty, Allah Almighty regarded both of them as his creation and Allah Almighty made it equal in the origin of creation, in the obligations in Islam, the worship system in Islam, the righteous deed and the reward for these righteous deeds, all of them they are absolutely equal. This is the same. There are few relaxation here and there for some of them. But Allah Almighty told us in one place in the Holy Quran that you should not wish for what Allah Almighty favored some of you over the other or one of you over the other. He is speaking to the two gender, to male and female. Do not wish for what Allah Almighty favored one of you over the other. So who is favored over who? It is not a specific gender over another gender. That is not how it stays. It says some of you over the other. So in some things, men probably are favored in creation. In others, female are favored in the creation. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he favored some of you over the other. In a few things. So do not wish for these things. Because each gender is created for a mission in life. And he has duties and responsibilities to carry. And that is why they are created in a such a way that is suited for that mission and these duties. Now, we are speaking today uh, about an important aspect that some people might overlook. It is a scientific, uh, a, a historic fact agreed upon by people all over the world, Muslims and non-Muslims, that Islam pro brought forward many positive changes regarding human rights, uh, women rights, environmental protections, and so on. Many of the things that humanity now takes for granted somehow or praises itself for reaching this level of maturity as human beings. Islam established the basis for all of these. One of them that we are speaking about today is the right of women or the place of women in Islam. So as we said, they are equal in the creation and in the obligations and duties and in the reward. Nothing uh, is different here between male and female. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that we have, for example, one complete chapter in the Holy Quran speaking about woman. The name is woman, literally. We have another one after the name of Maryam, peace be upon her. We do not have a chapter in the Holy Quran about men. It doesn't exist. Women, yes, you do have a chapter, but you don't have a chapter for women. Now, for male, we do have, for example, the Surah of Ibrahim, السلام, Surah of Yunus, السلام, Surah of Hud, السلام, but those are all, what? Prophets and messengers. Maryam is not a prophet, not a messenger. We do have one that is probably equal to, it, to her, who is Luqman. So Luqman is most likely was not a prophet or a messenger. But the concept here, in some places in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even give specific rulings regarding women. They ask you regarding the ruling about women, and Allah Almighty gives the fatwa to that. So Allah Almighty give you the fatwa regarding that, and He explains. So they were never in the back seat, like in some other religions and some other cultures. They were there. In fact, Islam emphasized their right for example, to education, about from the financial gain, their own financial gain, 
to men what they own and to women what they own. And their own right to inheritance, which they never had before. Uh, of course, at that time, they couldn't fight. Usually women don't fight. And usually, rarely do they trade at that time. And rarely do they participate in the open in discussions and so on. So all of these were unheard of before Islam in most societies in the world. That is why Umar says, when the Holy Quran was revealed and it started speaking about women, we then realized that women do have rights. We treated them as they absolutely nothing for them. Everything is for us, and that's it. But now we realize, no, the Holy Quran is speaking about them, that they are equal to us in these guidelines. One of the rights is the right to education. The Messenger ﷺ emphasized this right. We do have a beautiful hadith from the Messenger ﷺ saying, seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim. Every Muslim, Muslim here is a generic term, means every female and male Muslims. And in practice, the Messenger ﷺ did that as well. In one of the sermons of the Messenger ﷺ, he realized that probably women did not hear him correctly. They were far away from him. So he went after that and addressed them directly and gave them, repeated the same speech for them again. So that they have this right to hear what is being spoken about the religion and about the guidelines. And in fact, the woman came to the Messenger وسلم, one day and they demanded a day specifically to them for education. Say most of the time women, men are with you all the time and they are gaining knowledge. But we, we do not have this chance. So appoint for us a day, a place and a time for education and the Messenger وسلم, did that and addressed them. And furthermore, they were praised for their questioning. Aisha praised the woman of Al-Ansar because they were keen to seek knowledge and to ask about the religion even about sensitive issues that sometimes women shy from asking. So they never shied from asking to learn about the religion. Now based on all of these and many guidelines in Islam, this have uh, presented the Islamic history with a great number of outstanding women throughout the Islamic history. In the Holy Quran, for example, Allah Almighty speaks greatly about Maryam and call her Siddiqa, saint. He speaks greatly about the wife of Fir'aun, Asiya, radiallahu anha. Uh, in the seerah of the Messenger, وسلم, we have outstanding figure like Khadija, radiallahu anha, the first person to embrace Islam and believe in the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi was a woman. The, uh, we, we do have also Fatima, radiallahu anha, the offspring of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, from Fatima, radiallahu anha, who used to help uh, her father at, uh, from a young age uh, and later on help her husband. We do have Aisha radiallahu the most knowledgeable woman in Islamic history, throughout Islamic history and arguably the most knowledgeable out of all people in Islam after the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha, Umm al muminin the mother of the believer, the wife of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Sahaba, even the elders used to come and ask her and seek her opinion. This didn't stop at that age, it continued. At the time of Umar عنه, for example, we have a Shifa عنها, and Umar عنه, used to ask her and consult her a lot regarding many major issues and he appointed her as the auditor in the market to make sure that people are not cheating and that the items and the quality of the item, quality check and quality control. The one who was in charge of that in Islamic history early on was a woman. That never stopped her from getting that because she had the knowledge and that she had the expertise. Umar appointed her in this sensitive uh, position. Uh, we have many outstanding physicians, for example, doctors in all fields of uh, knowledge, uh, in tafsir, hadith, and, uh, and fiqh, uh, in the worldly knowledge as well, for example, in medicine, uh, in history, in uh, uh, poem and literatures. Uh, just to give you a, a glimpse about the concept, just to give you a glimpse, there is a book published about the outstanding woman in Islamic history. So speaking only about the outstanding among them. This is called A'lam nisa It is a five volume book, exactly 2039 pages. 
in some of the pages you will find five names so you can just guess how many are mentioned those are the outstanding women in history in every field uh, of knowledge now uh, to give you also another glimpse at the time of Ibn Asakir approximately 900 years or so uh, he, he is speaking about his own city only in one city and he mentioned the name of more than 500 female teacher who used to teach in different sciences at that time you can only imagine uh, the concept so they were the opportunity was open in front of them one outstanding innovation uh, at the time of the Messenger وسلم, that we still practice till today and probably forever all over the Islamic world was actually invented the idea and the invention was by a woman one of the Sahaba and came to the Messenger وسلم, and presented him with the idea of having a pulpit member so that people will see him and his voice will reach further and the Messenger وسلم, agreed to that and her own worker she said I have a worker who can do that who can actually implement the idea and he did it and he built it for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used it so every khatib, every lecturer that goes to a pulpit after that after a member in every mosque in the whole of the Islamic world throughout Islamic history the favor goes to that woman she never hesitated, thinking that, oh woman, what can I do in front of the rest of the Sahaba, Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman, and all the major elites of the Islamic world in every field. She never shied from that. She presented her idea directly to the Messenger Sallallahu They knew this concept throughout. Because they understand the Messenger Sallallahu guided Muslims to treat women well. Allah Almighty mentioned this in the Holy Quran. The Messenger Sallallahu repeated that often and often again. So much so, the Messenger وسلم, puts the criteria for a person's goodness in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in front of people is the way he treats his woman. The way you treat women, this is your criteria of being a gentle person or not, a noble person or not. The Messenger وسلم, said, the best among you are those who are best to their women. Yes, obviously. Because the way you treat your wife, your mother, your sister, your daughter, woman around you, this is an actual indication of how good you are, of a person. Because in, you are within a family, in closed circuits, so a person might do an injustice or some harm, God forbid, nobody's seeing that, nobody's noticing it. A person might be bad to his family, but in front of people, he's the most noble, the most gentle, nobody knows. So what is the real person? Is he the one inside the house or the one outside the house? The one inside the house, that is the real you. Outside the house, many people put a show, put a face only to impress people or to be thought of as being good people and so on. That is not the real you. The real you is the way you deal with the rest of the people within the society. Those that you have, you are in authority over them. So that is how careful it should be for a person when he is treating a woman and caring for them. This was a very quick glimpse about the idea because sadly there are some misconceptions among Muslims and non-Muslims alike about the role of women and uh, the position of women. This is an, an, uh, something that is uh, vastly uh, relaxed in Islam. Basically anything that suits them, anything that suits them, they can work in it. There are some guidelines for people, men and women, when going outside and dress code and behavior and so on. It applies to both of them. So within the Islamic guidelines, this is something that is uh, open for any woman to achieve. They are part of the society. They have great missions uh, inside the house and outside the house. One of the outstanding points in Islam is that it considered work inside the house as an equal work to men outside the house. Nothing, no favor. So that, that is considered work as well. Nowadays, sadly, sometimes people are referring to say, uh, is she a working woman or stay at home? No, this is wrong. It should be, is she working inside the house or outside the house? Because inside the house, she also has duties. And she's doing a great job. Uh, so that is the concept, this concept of clarifying this point. The Messenger وسلم, made a generic statement that women are the twins of men. Full stop. Everything. Women are the twins of men. 
And when the, the, they asked Aisha and the rest of the wives of the Messenger وسلم, about how the Messenger وسلم, was inside the house when he is with the family, how was he? She replied with a very surprising answer. She said he used to be in the service of his family. Serving the family, subhanAllah. Until it is the time for salah, then he will leave. So in that inside the house, just a member of the family. We are one community, one unity uh, within the society that you need to uh, pay attention to uh, the, with mutual respect and understanding and good treatment that is required from both of them. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are obedient to their parents, mothers and fathers. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are best uh, to their uh, women. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who keep connection with their relatives. Ameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.